Michael Jordan, the iconic basketball player considered by most to be the greatest pe uh, player of all time, experienced failure. In fact, while he was in his sophomore year at high school, he was cut from the basketball team because he did not meet the minimum height to play basketball. Jordan said he was so devastated by this that he used his disappointment to fuel a fire inside of him that inspired him to work even more harder than before. And as the saying goes, the rest is history. Jordan never looked back. And we all know of his exploits. He went on to become the greatest player of all time. Winning just about every accolade in a storied career. And when asked about his failure, this is what Jordan had to say. He said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I've been entrusted to take the game-winning shot. And I missed I failed over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Michael Jordan. Yet Michael Jordan isn't the only one who made a spectacular comeback from failure in his career. Steve Jobs, the revolutionary tech icon, and I'm sure there are many of us holding an Apple phone today, it was because of Steve Jobs. He was one of the co-founders of the Apple company. And through his visionary leadership, Apple became a tech giant within the first few years after he founded the company. And then the unthinkable happened. Jobs was fired from the company that he started. And this subsequently led to a string of failures with other companies that he tried to start. And as fate would have it, these failures led Steve Jobs right back to the CEO position of Apple. And when asked about his failures, this is what Steve Jobs said. He said, I didn't see it then. But it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have happened to me. The reason why Jobs said that is because his failure helped him to gain new insights about himself and the tech industry. And because of his reimagined vision, Apple is now the most valuable company in the world worth a staggering $3.5 trillion. Could you believe it? You say, well, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> These stories of failure flipped into success is what we are going to see in our text this morning. Jesus was preaching. Praise the Lord. Jesus was preaching to the multitudes near the lake of Gennesaret. And to escape the press from the crowds, he entered into Simon's boat and pushed out a little bit from the shore. And he began to teach the people. When he was finished, he told Simon, he says, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon reluctantly obeyed, and to his surprise, the catch was so great that his net would have broke had it not been for the help that he got from his partners. And the key lesson that we can take away from this incident is this. When you obey God fully, I want to stress on the word fully, because some people only obey God partially. But when you obey God fully, 
He can turn around your failure into success. I said he can turn around your failure into success. Let's take a look at our text and see how the story unfolded. We are in the gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 5. We're reading from verse 1 to 11. Luke 5 verse 1 to 11. If you have it in your Bibles, you can find it or you can follow on the screen. I read, you will follow. It says... So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. I want you to notice that. He saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and they were washing their nets. Interesting. The fishermen were not in the boat. They were not fishing. They were washing their nets. Notice that in the text. It says, Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep. And let down your nets. Do you see an S at the end of the, end of the word? Yes. Nets. Pural. He says, let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. In other words, they had abysmal failure. They didn't even catch a fry dry. <laughs> He said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the what? Net. The net. You notice that? All right. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And their net, singular, was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Could you imagine that? Just a few hours before, there was no fish in the water. No, their boats were sinking under the weight of fish. I want you to keep that image in mind. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished. They were amazed. They were dumbfounded at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, Notice, they forsook all and followed him. This is actually a, build, a companion message to the message we shared last week on follow me. You need to hear that message as well. But we thank God for this opportunity this morning. And for all of us gathered, I'm speaking on the subject, finding a future after failure. There is a future after your failure. Amen. This is a two-part message. I'm sharing the first part this week. The second part I will be sharing probably in two weeks' time. So I want you to be careful how you hear this word this morning. And how many of you sitting here this morning have experienced failure? I mean major failure. And I'm sure we've all experienced failure. Because failure is a common part of life. And if you haven't experienced failure yet, hold on. Don't panic. It's coming. It's coming. The old people used to say, what a pass here? I miss you. What a pass here? It's a miss you. It's coming. Hold on. 
Sometimes failure is a result of your own doing. At other times, it's because of what other people do. But in the final analysis, it really doesn't matter who caused the failure. The point is, you will encounter failure at some point in time in your life. And sometimes that failure may be so terrible that it will entice you to abandon your faith. It will entice you to say, you see me, I give up on them Christian and them. Sometimes life has a way of hitting you. Low blows, curveballs. And you say, you see me, I, I done with that boy. I didn't sign up for that. And you abandon your faith. You abandon your family. And so the question for you and I this morning is what do you do when you experience failure? We are going to discover the answer to that question by looking at how the disciples handled this failure in the text. We are going to see how Jesus intervened and redirected their failure into success. This passage is so rich. That's why I have to break this message into two parts. It is so rich that we could go in a number of directions. But the first thing I want you to see this morning from this text is this. No one is exempt from experiencing failure. I want to repeat that. No one is exempt from experiencing failure. Absolutely no one. These guys, they were professional fishermen. They knew those waters like the back of their hand. And yet, they failed to catch any fish. Fishing was their life profession. It was their greatest skill. It was their area of competence. And yet, the Bible says that they failed abysmally. They, they fished all night. Listen to what verse 2 of the text says. It says, And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. I want you to notice what the fishermen were doing when Jesus came on the scene. It says they were washing their nets. In other words, they were not fishing. Why? Because they had spent the whole night fishing. And they caught nothing. So their failure was so chronic. That they got tired of failing and they quit. You ever try doing something for so long and you, you get tired of not working. What do you do? You quit. Someone says it's insanity to keep doing the same thing and expecting the same results, expecting different results. These guys, they got tired. They quit. I don't know how long they were fishing. Maybe they spent eight hours. Maybe they spent 12 hours. I don't know. But it was enough for them to say, I had enough. So what did they do? They began to wash their nets. And they were preparing for their next tour of duty. So their failure led them to the conclusion that there were no fish to be found in these waters of Genesaret. That's the conclusion that they came to. That's why they were washing their nets. Why fish and there's no fish to catch? And sometimes failure can mash up so bad. Causes you to get fed up. Causes you to quit. You throw in the towel. And I imagine if I were the, those disciples, I would be doing the same thing. Could you imagine fishing whole night and catch nothing? That's your live, that's your livelihood. You too would be right there with those disciples the next morning, washing your nets. In fact, that is exactly what many of us find ourselves doing when we fail. You may have been working on a project at work, and it failed. You become so jilted that you retreat to some activity to numb the pain. What do you end up doing? 
Just like the disciples, you're there washing your nets. Or it may be a situation at home. You put in so much time and effort into building this relationship. And instead of the relationship blossoming, it unravels into a spectacular failure. And before you know it, you find yourself on the shores of life, washing your nets, wondering what went wrong. But you know what I find interesting about the disciples' failure? They were experienced fishermen. They knew the waters better than anyone else. Yet, they failed. So what this tells me is that it really doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how competent you are. It doesn't matter how experienced or how much skills you have. It doesn't matter where you sit on the economic totem pole. No one is exempt from failure. Each of us will experience failure at some point in time. And sometimes that failure is going to show up in an area where you're most competent, where you're most skilled. This is what happened to the disciples. No matter how skilled they were at fishing, their skills wasn't enough. To shield them from the failure they encountered. And I'm saying to you this morning, no matter how gifted, no matter how talented, no matter how knowledgeable you are, there is coming a point in time in your life when you will discover that failure is no respect of persons. It is one of the great levelers of humanity. We saw it with Michael Jordan. We saw it with Steve Jobs. They failed. They were at the top of their game. They are the top in their respective fields. Yet, they failed. The disciples failed. So who are you? And sometimes failure will come when we least expect it. Sometimes it sneaks up on us. And suddenly you realize that you're unprepared to deal with this failure that is knocking on your door. And all of a sudden you realize that you're not as good as you thought you were. Because no one is exempt from experiencing failure. And you go through the history books, you will see. That the greatest of men and women down through the ages have all experienced failure and setback. So we have to ground ourselves with the understanding that we are not special. We are not exempt from failure. Instead, the question we have to ask ourselves is, if I am not exempt from failure, who will I turn to when I fail? Because you will fail. You will fail. At some point in time, you're going to fail. So who are you going to turn to? What are you going to turn to when that comes? Because I tell you this, not everyone can handle failure. And when some people fail, especially when they fail, in an abysmal failure, they turn to the three S's. You say, what are the three S's? People turn to these three S's to numb their failure. The first S is substance abuse. Some people turn to alcohol, to drugs, and various substances to numb their failure. Then there are those who turn to the second S. The S of sexual promiscuity. Again, it's because they're trying to numb out the failure. And so they turn to that. And then finally there are those who turn to the third S. The S of song. Have you ever heard the saying, wine, woman, and song? Some people turn to song. Or entertainment. They try to drum out their failure with various forms of entertainment. They become a party animal. 
But they're empty on the inside. Because they're trying to drown out that failure. They're trying to distract themselves. But the big mistake that people make in turning to these three S's is that they get caught up in a web of bigger failures. Because when you turn to these three S's, it leads to failure after failure after failure. Unending failure. In fact, when you expose yourself to the three S's, it leads to addictions in one form or the other. And so instead of resolving your problems, you end up compounding them to the point where you become entangled in this never-ending web of bigger failures. This is what happens when you turn to the wrong S. But when you encounter failure, you need to turn to the fourth S. You know what the fourth S is? The Son of God is the fourth S. Jesus is the only one that could truly deal with your failures. He is the answer to the big questions, the big problems that you have in life. Turning to anything else is going to lead to a hollow and miserable experience. You see, you have been created with a void in your heart that only Jesus can fill. So when you try to fill that void with something else, it's equivalent to trying to fill a car with water that was designed to run on gas. What will happen if you do that? If you fill your gas tank with water, <laughs> you go get a put, 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 and then plow, shut down, can't move. Because it wasn't designed to function on water. You were designed to function with Jesus Christ at the center of your life. So if you put anything else in there but Jesus, you will continue to fail. So the only remedy for your failure is the fourth S. The Son of God. This takes me to the second point I want to make this morning. And it's this. Remember the first thing we said. No one is exempt from failure. Secondly, recognize that all it takes is one word from God to turn around your failure into success. All it takes, all it takes to turn around your failure into success is one word from God. I don't care what the failure is. I don't care how deeply entrenched in the failure you are. All it takes is one word from God to turn around that failure into success. The Bible tells us that his word is life. When Jesus spoke, imagine the same person who spoke the worlds into being. The same person who said, let there be light. Is the same one who said to them, launch out into the deep. You see the problem with us. We have too low a view of the word of God. We think that the word of God is just like some other book. Some kind of novel or the newspapers or something else. But we need to understand that the words of God, they are words of life. Amen. They can breathe new life into a situation. That's why we need to have a high view of the word of God. You can't compare the word of God with a textbook or a novel. No, they are two completely different things. The word of God is high and lifted up. The word of God is above all else. Everything else is way down there. So we need to start seeing the word of God as high and lifted up. And we bring ourselves under the word of God. The word of God is high. And don't be like those people who say, well, I hear you, you know. I hear you. I hear you talking about the word. 
I tried that and it didn't work. And that's what the disciples said, you know. When the Lord told them launch out, they said, Lord, we told all night, we do that already. It ain't working, it had no fish in the water. Have you heard people say that? They say, you know, I hear you, you know. But you see that Christian thing you're talking about? That don't work. That don't work. I tried that already. That don't work. But let me ask you a question this morning. Do you really think that the word of God is ineffective? Do you really believe that the word of God lacks any power? Of course not. But if the answer to that question is no, then why do we fail when we try to put the word of God to work? Why does it seem like it doesn't work? And then when we look in the Bible, we see Jesus wielding the word like a sword. And it working like that. Like clockwork. Why do we get different results to Jesus? Why do we get different results to the apostles? Why does it seem like the word does not work? Well, I want to say to you this morning... That the word is not the only variable in the equation. There is something else in the mortar beside the pestle. How many of you have heard that expression? <laughs> There's something else in the mortar beside the pestle. There's something else in this equation. Allow me to explain. According to Acts 10 38. The writer says Jesus healed every, everywhere he went, right? Yeah. It says everywhere he went, he was doing good. He healed the sick. He drove out demons. And all with the same word that you and I have access to today. But do you know that when this same Jesus, who was going all over the place, doing good, it says, when he came to his own hometown in Nazareth. Check it out in Mark chapter 6. You know what the Bible says? This same Jesus who had all of this success. When he came to his hometown. It says he could do no mighty works there. You know what was the reason the Bible gave? It's not that Jesus lacked power. You know. It's not that the word couldn't work. You know. The Bible says because of the people's unbelief. Now I think a lot of people misinterpret what that scripture actually said. It said he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. It's not because that the word somehow became ineffective is not because the word in his own hometown suddenly lost its power that wasn't the case because the word the bible says is what incorruptible seed incorruptible you know what incorruptible means it means that it cannot be corrupted it cannot be tainted the word of god is incorruptible seed it cannot lose its power so there's something else in the mortar. <laughs> the Bible says because of their unbelief. So because they had unbelief, they didn't come to Jesus. And because they didn't come to Jesus, there was no opportunity for them to be healed. The only people who experienced healing were the people who came to Jesus. The only people who came to him were the people who had minor aches and pains. And the Bible says he laid his hands on them and they were healed. So the people who had little headache, little toothache, those were the only people who were coming to Jesus. And he laid hands and they were healed. The people who had the big issues, the, the palsy and the blindness and the deafness and so on, 
were not coming to him. Why were they not coming to him? Because of their unbelief. The Bible says that they took offense. Because they say, we know you. We see you when you was a little snotty nose boy. We see you grow up right in front of our eyes. You now come into play. Big time healer. And the Bible says they were offended. And because of their offense, it created a barrier. It kept them from going to Jesus. And that is why nobody was healed. Could you imagine that? The one who had all healing power and virtue touched down in their town and nobody was healed. It's not because something was wrong with Jesus. It's not because something was wrong with the word. It's because something was wrong with the people. You see, the word of God is effective in any location. But if the people are infected with unbelief, then they can hinder the word from flowing in their life. This is what happened to the people in, in Jesus' hometown. They allowed their offense to block them from receiving the healing that Jesus came to provide. Imagine he came to give gifts of healing, breakthroughs, deliverance. And they put up a barrier. Go away from here. We are offended by you. And that same thing happens today. You go and tell people about the good news. They put up a barrier. Salvation comes in their house, you know. And they are not saved. Healing comes in their house, you know. And they are not saved. Not because the word lacks power. Because of the barriers that we put up in our hearts. Every single person who came to Jesus got healed. So the problem is never with the word of God. The word is incorruptible seed. The problem is with us and our unbelief. We allow unbelief to pollute our faith. And our unbelief could negate and actually prevent the power of God from flowing in your life. You don't believe me? That's why Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. Listen to what he said to them. He said, because of your teachings, because of your traditions of men, you make the word of God of no effect. So it's not that the word doesn't work, but the traditions of men, the wrong doctrines, the unbelief, stops the word of God from getting to you. And that's why we said one of the most important things for you is to fully obey the word of God. Don't partially obey. Fully obey. Because only when you fully obey it will produce the desired effect of transformation, of flipping that failure into a success. So I say to you again, all it takes to turn around your situation is one word from God. Amen. Let's see how this happened in the text. When Jesus spoke into the disciples' failure, I want you to notice how the word came. The word came in the form of a command, not a suggestion. What did Jesus tell Peter to do? He says, launch out into the deep. In other words, Peter had to act on that word. If he didn't act on the word, they would have not caught anything. When God's word finds you in the midst of your failure, it will always come in the form of a command. Because the command you obey will determine the miracle you receive. You didn't hear me. The command you obey will determine the miracle you receive. 
Let's see what happens here. Peter said to the Lord, the Lord tell him, eh? the Lord tell him, launch out into the deep. He telling the Lord, as though he know better than the Lord, we fish all night. We had zero success. Lord, yeah, make motor. I am a professional fisherman. I know these waters better than you. I am no Johnny come lately. I doing this thing for years. I can do this thing in my sleep. You ever hear people say that? And sometimes that's what we say. God gives us a command to a servant. And you know what we say? Who do you think you is, boy? I know better than you. We say, I tried that already. That don't work. In fact, you know what you're going to say? I try all kind of things, you know. I try everything. If they have a thing I didn't try. And all of them things don't work. What makes you think that what you say, Mr. Minister, going to work? Well, I want to tell you something this morning. You know why it's going to work? Because of who is saying it. It is because of who is saying it. <laughs> Peter reluctantly recognized this. He said, Lord, you know, although we do all that fishing last night, because you said, because you said, I will honor your word. He didn't fully agree. Eh? He didn't fully believe. And we're going to see that in part two. But he said, Lord, at your word, I'm going to let down the net. Singular. God told him, let down the net. Eh? He said, at your word, I will let down the net. What made the difference? Because he let down the net the night before. Didn't he? And they caught what? Nothing. Nothing. What was different this time around? No. Who said it? Who said it? Jesus told him. Jesus spoke a word. You see, this is why I say we need to have a high view of the word. The water was the same water. The boat was the same boat. The net was the same net. Peter was the same Peter. What was different? Who said it? You see how powerful the word is? Sometimes we forget who is saying it to us. Don't get tied up in how the word is packaged. Sometimes you look at the package and you miss the contents. Look at the contents. Don't get tied up in the package. You see, Jesus wouldn't come. Jesus will not come to us as we expect. Jesus is not going to come, you know, floating from the sky. My son, my daughter, I have said it to you. Go and do it. No. Jesus sometimes is going to come through a vagrant. Jesus sometimes is going to come through somebody in your workplace. Jesus sometimes is going to come through an email. We need to have a high view of the word. Don't disrespect the word because of who it is coming through. Right? Note what I said. Who it is coming through. Not from. It is coming from the Lord. Through a vessel to you. Amen. We forget who is saying it. Because the word of Jesus isn't the same as the word of the politician. You know them politician, right? They tell you one thing and what are they going to do? The opposite thing. The word of Jesus. Jesus has integrity. His integrity cannot be questioned. So always remember who is saying it. Jesus is the one saying it. And because he is saying it, he has the power to back up his word. So Peter says, Lord, that's one thing he got right. He says, Lord, because you said it. Now what I find interesting about this whole account, remember I tell you this thing is so rich. 
Did you notice that Jesus paid no attention to Peter's excuses? When he started to mouth off and say, but we fished last night, we do all that. Jesus completely ignored that. He paid no attention. He did not even try to respond to his questions and his doubts. You know why Jesus operated that way? Because he knows that his word trumps everything else. When I speak, things are going to happen. When I speak, things are going to change. That's the mindset that Jesus had. He knew that his word trumped everything else. So you could say what you want. I spoke my word. And I know that my word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish the thing that which I have sent it to accomplish. So Jesus don't have to get bogged down in his doubts and fears and all of that rambling. He, didn't, he did not even address that. Hmm. And so I want to say to you, I don't care what the report of the doctor says. I don't care what the bank says. I don't care what they say on the job. When Jesus speaks his word, trumps everybody else. That is the attitude we need to have. When Jesus says it, you say, I believe it. And that settles it. It may not make sense, but I believe it. Because his word is where? Up here. Everybody else's word is down there. So you don't need to understand how the word works. You know. All you need to know, that it works. Jesus didn't try to give his disciples an explanation. You notice that? He just released the command. Because that is how kings operate. Kings and emperors don't give explanations. They give decrees. Back in the days, when these emperors would sit on their thrones, they would simply issue a decree. And that decree was so powerful that the decree actually became law. And if you decide you ain't going to follow that decree, you're going to lose your life. You remember the situation with King Nebuchadnezzar? So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And this dream disturbed him greatly. But when he woke up from the dream, he can't remember the dream. So what did Mr. Nebuchadnezzar do? What, did, what do kings do? He issued a decree. He said, bring my wise men inside here. He said, listen to this decree I given all you. He said, I had a dream last night. I can't remember what the dream was. So you guys have to tell me what I dream and tell me what the dream means. Could you imagine that? They must have thought, but what kind of madman is this boy? Which planet did he fall from? Tell me what I dreamt and tell me what the dream means. That is how kings operate. So they said to him, Master, what you're asking cannot be done by mere mortals like us. It could only be done by the gods, and they don't dwell among us. Hear what the king said. He says, I realize you guys are trying to stall for time, but I will have none of it. By six o'clock this evening, if you had tell me what my dream is and what it means, I'm going to have your head. And panic fill the room. <laughs> Kings don't give explanation, they give decrees. And were it not for the intervention of Daniel and his three friends, all of those wise men would have lost their heads. But what is the point that I'm making? This is how kings operate. Jesus is a king. He gives commands. He gives decrees. And when he gives a decree, he is not bothering with what you have to say about your excuse and why it ain't gonna work and all this kind of da la 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 la. No, I gave a decree. It's gonna come to pass. This is the mindset that Jesus wants us to have. When you know that the word of God is on your lip, you can speak to any mountain. 
You could speak to any situation. You could speak to any failure. Because the word of God trumps everything. The word of God is quick. It is sharp. It is powerful. It can pierce and divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow. The word of God has the power within itself to transform your situation. Remember I said that the word, it's life. When you speak the word, you're speaking life into that situation. That's the word. It's powerful. So we need to have a high view of the word. The word doesn't lack any power. It is sufficient. The word can turn around your failure into success. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. <laughs> Peter realized that to an extent and that's why he obeyed and he was thoroughly amazed he was dumbfounded he, when he saw the catch he could not believe it could not believe it he must have thought but wait now am I in the same place was I teleported to some other location where them fish come from This situation is what we refer to as a boundary point in their lives. It was a significant turning point. Because prior to this incident, they were merely fishermen, fishing for fish. But once Jesus came on the scene, everything changed. When Jesus comes into your life, everything is going to change that's why he comes into our lives to bring about transformation and change he specializes in using the failures of your life to shift us into divine purpose this is what he did for the disciples this is what he wants to do for you this morning where they saw failure he saw a brand new future. He flipped that failure on its head. And he used it to pull them into the Jesus movement. Amen. And as I conclude this morning. I want to remind someone sitting on here this morning. Someone who has failure on your mind. I want to say to you that that failure is not the end. Your failure is not the end. It is not the last line in the script of your life. Instead, it's a new beginning. It's the beginning of a new future. A future that is fraught with destiny. Jesus wants to use your failure for his glory. You see, with God, not even your failures are wasted. What an awesome God we serve. He knows how to use even your failures. He doesn't allow your failures to go to waste. He uses it for his glory. You say, well, how come? It's because he knows that no one is exempt from failure. It's because he knows that all it takes to transform your failure into success is one word from God because the word is quick it is sharp it can pierce and divide soul and spirit joint and marrow the word is able to restore everything that you've lost God says I am creating a brand new future after your failure all heads bowed this morning all eyes closed. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word to our hearts and our hearing, mighty God. Father, we thank you that you are able to use our failures for your glory. And God says there's someone in here 
you didn't expect to hear a word like this but there's someone here you've been fixated on your failures and because you are fixated on your failures you can't move forward your failure has become a prison cell. Your failure has become a barrier. God says he wants to deliver you. He wants to give you a new future after your failure. And you may be in here. You are outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've heard of him, yes. But you've never committed your life. You've been contented to stay in the back. Stay on the periphery. Stay behind the fence. You know it's almost like you're a little child. You're looking through the fence. And you're watching what's going on. Jesus says today's your day. For you to come from behind the fence. Into his presence. And so if you are here this morning, we're going to make two calls. Those who have failure and that failure is immobilize you, we're going to make a second call for you. But the first call, you are here this morning. You know that you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may have been in a relationship. You've backslidden. You've turned your back on the Lord. You may have encountered some failure that caused you to turn, your, turn away from the Lord. God says, you are here today because of a divine setup. So if you want to commit your life to Jesus Christ, I want to ask you to raise your hand. We're going to see it. We're going to pray with you and for you. If there's anyone here, just raise your hand. You want to commit your life to Jesus. You've heard the word. You could, once you raise your hand, you can put it back down. I see one hand. I see one hand. Is there another? Is there another hand that will lift, be lifted up here? I want to let you know something. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Tomorrow is not promised. Tomorrow is not promised. All you have is now. All you have is this moment. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Don't say I ain't ready. When the spirit of the Lord is speaking, we're going to ask one more time. Is there one more person? You say preacher, I've heard the word. I want to commit my life to Jesus. Raise your hand. We're going to see it. We're going to pray with you. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. We're going to pray with you. Those who have raised your hand, we're not going to prolong this. Those who have raised your hand, we want to ask you, come to the front. Meet me at the front. Hallelujah. We give you praise. Let's put our hands together for our sister. Mighty God, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. But you know, I sense there's somebody else inside here. That the Lord is speaking to you. The Lord, you are fighting. You are literally fighting with the voice of the Holy Spirit. Don't put it off. What if you were to lose your life before the end of today? Where would you wake up? Would you wake up in the presence of the Lord? Or would you wake up with the sounds of crackling? Where the fire is not quenched? Where the worm dieth not? Today is the day of salvation. Is there one more person? The Spirit of the Lord is speaking. We're going to give you 10 seconds. Is there one more person here this morning? The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you. He's calling you. He's calling you by name. Don't put it off. Hallelujah. My sister, I want to commend you for what you have done here today. God is pleased. God is smiling. 
the angels are recording your name in the book of life because of what you're going to do here this morning and so i want to ask you my sister i want to ask everyone to repeat this prayer after me this is not a magical prayer this is simply a prayer of repentance it is the first step in a new direction but you have to follow this up amen and so i want to ask everyone to stand and repeat these words after me say lord jesus i am a sinner in need of a savior lord jesus i confess and repent of all my sins forgive me lord and cleanse me from all unrighteousness lord jesus i believe you died for my sins you rose again from the dead you are now seated at the right hand of the father i now make you my savior and lord in jesus name amen father I thank you for your daughter right now mighty god i pray that your anointing will fall fresh upon her we break every chain every habit every thing that the enemy has tried to put on her to tangle her up you know what i hear the, the lord saying the enemy is trying to wrap you up and tangle you up such that you can't move but we use the sword of god we cut asunder every tie every chain everything that the enemy has tried to put on you we sever it right now we lose you in the mighty name of jesus and lord i pray that you will fill this vessel with your holy spirit that out of her belly will flow rivers rivers of living water we call forth rivers of living water mighty god baptize her with your holy spirit in jesus name in jesus name koshata daba shete yandoro boshata ye koro boshete ye toko shandoro boshata ya toko shete receive receive in the mighty name of jesus receive receive in the mighty name in the mighty name of jesus receive the spirit of the living god yatoko shata hallelujah hallelujah praise god you could go with our sister hallelujah we bless you lord could we give god a high note of praise i said i was making two calls There's someone here. The enemy is using your failure to buffet you. He's you he keep reminding you of your failure. It's like he's not allowing you to forget it. He's bringing it up like a recurring decimal in your mind. Remember that. Remember that. And he's buffeting you. But the spirit of the Lord says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You feel like your failure is holding you back. You feel like your failure is keeping you from stepping into the things of God. Come to the front. We're not going to prolong this folks. Come to the front. The spirit of the Lord is here. And where the spirit of the Lord is there's liberty. There's freedom. You know that that word this morning fell straight into your garden. Come to the front. We want to pray with you. Amen. And worship him. Worship him. Come on. Oh, worship him. Bow down and worship Him. Let us enter in. 
Oh, enter in. Come on, bow down, bow down. Bow down and worship Him. With uplifted hands, no spectators here. No spectators, only worshipers. Worship us. Oh, I worship him. him. Come on. Bow down. Bow down and worship him. Worship him. Oh, worship him. Come on. Bow down. Bow down. Bow down and worship him. With uplifted hands. Worship Consuming fire, consuming fire, sweet perfume, his awesome presence filled it. Consuming fire, consuming fire, sweet perfume, his awesome presence. One more call. The Lord is speaking to you. Failure is keeping you from pressing into the things of God. It's a barrier. It's immobilizing you. You know that the enemy is keep bringing that failure back to your mind. You don't have peace. God says he wants to deliver you from that this morning. One more time we're going to make a call. Is there anyone like that? Come to the front. We're going to pray with you and for you. If not, hallelujah. If not, Father, we thank you. Yes. I thank you for what you have done here this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you have shifted us into a new future. You are shifting us into a new future. God, we submit, we surrender Hallelujah. all to you. Yes, Lord. Surrender, Lord. We surrender. Have your way in us. Have your way in us, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And the church say, Amen. Oh, enter in. Bow down. Bow down. down. We're going to wait on you for the tides. And the designated offering, and then we're gonna take up the seed offering. So first the tide and the designated oh, offering, and then the seed. Bow down and worship him, enter in. Oh, enter in.
God, we thank you for the gifts of your people. I pray that you will breathe upon it, multiply it. Give us the grace and the wisdom to administrate over these funds. Let every need be met in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church of Jesus Christ say, Amen, amen and Amen. You can have your seats momentarily. I realize I, it, I, it neglected me to mention. You can have your seats. The parents of the mother of the baby who was dedicated today, they are very good friends of mine, Brother Steve and Sister Laura. I want to acknowledge them. Yes, let us put our hands together for them. Okay. You want to say a few words? Anybody wants to say a few words? Laura? No? All right, uh, we go all the way back. Um, when I was living in Marval, you know, they had a fruit and vegetable store that I would frequently patronize. I've always found them to be loving and very warm people, and it's such a privilege um, to have them in our service today. And, you know, we want to extend an invitation to you that you all will come back again and visit with us. We look forward to all that God is going to continue to do in and through your lives. Amen. So God bless you all. Thank you all for being here. In Jesus' name. Sister Christine. Oh, 